others to watch later. Um, so today we're going to go over how to create your own variable grid. And Patrick Callahan and Adam Harrington are our local experts on this. And so they'll be giving this presentation. And so I'll hand it over to Patrick. Thank you. All right, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so yeah, this is the uh, third part of the music tutorial series. And we're gonna talk about uh, creating variable resolution grids today, how to make them and install them. And uh, some uh, preliminaries, I'm gonna go ahead and switch yeah, off my video. Right. Yes. It's not in presenter mode. I don't know if you wanted it. Yeah, it's um, my mouse disappears on me when I go the other way. So I just don't okay. want to fight with it. So if it's okay with everyone, they can see my little miniature slides up to the side. Oh yeah, um, you can see your mouse very clearly too. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, and so I, yeah, I'm gonna switch up my video. I'm having some trouble with my internet. So I would reduce the bandwidth uh, a bit. Um, so that I particularly when to get to using the editor, um, you know, things come across clearly. So some preliminaries uh, that we have here is um, the VRM tools have been updated very recently, uh, January 11th. So um, if you have an old version, you should uh, um, reclone them or reacquire the, the source code. And um, if you, uh, and rebuild the editor, um, the one thing that's in there is the executable for the Macintosh is not updated to the new source code. So, and uh, I don't know that that's gonna happen anytime soon. So if you want to use uh, the new features that uh, we're going to kind of talk about today, um, you're, you're going to have to do the case where you build it and you know maybe run on Casper or on your own uh, Linux machine. Or if you know how to work a Macintosh and figure out you know how to do that, you can build it on a Macintosh. Um, so if you are running on Casper, um, there you know is a, a latency issue, and uh, it is reduced if you uh, use the uh, VNC interface uh, with a remote desktop. And so there's instructions there uh, on the slide here that show you know, how to do that. Um, and uh, so if you're following along, it'd be beneficial to go through that process and, um, and it will give you, uh, you know, more responsive uh, behavior in the editor. So uh, uh, overview of uh, what we're gonna talk about today. So it's gonna be a brief overview of um, kind of the, the process of uh, you know, the, the overall process because it's assumed that most users have gone through and looked at the previous tutorials and gone through the documentation. So they're familiar with the details of it. But so we're just gonna give a brief overview, overview of, of the process for context. And uh, then we're gonna talk about um, creating uh, grids and the new features in, in the VRM editor and, uh, and the ability to manually edit uh, the grid files or, you know, the grids to clean them up with the kind of uh, little blemishes that you can get when you're trying to create a, a nice uniform uh, grid. And then we'll talk about, you know, some of the best practices in terms of making a grid. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, uh, not so much about the process of, of creating the input, input file, but more about, you know, some things that uh, have gone wrong and, you know, and, you know, the sort of the details that happen as code base develops and uh, and you have to adjust to you know a moving target in a sense um, and then we're, you know we're going to uh, give a review of uh, the um, the process of getting the model running and then you know all the, the final details of, of the uh, uh, scientists you know what you have to do for a science run and, uh, and then there'll be you know time for people that we can talk about you know any issues people have had with making their own grids. And uh, so based on the, the registration, uh, participants are interested in, in regional refinement across the entire globe. So, you know, we're going to, you know, hopefully uh, be able to accommodate everyone's uh, needs for um, what their scientific uh, interests are. So in terms of an overview, so the usage scenario we have set up is, um, you know, because we're not going to maintain all the grids that everyone can make. And so the people had to be able to maintain their own. So they have, we have a uh, you know, the uh, users can create their own local repository, uh, maintain their grids and their files. And then um, as you know, in that repository, we want to try and have it so it's um, not so much tag independent. So you have to don't, don't go through a big process 
of reinstalling things and refiguring things out when you move from one tag to another. Um, so most tag changes um, as, you're evol as, as the code is evolving um, should be um, you know, transparent and you should just be able to use your repository. But that's not always gonna be the case. You're gonna have to, you know, uh, as things go, we're gonna, uh, pretty soon we're gonna have a case where we have to maintain two different methods um, as we change the infrastructure to new OPSI. Um, you know, we're gonna have to be able to accommodate the old version, old way and the new way, and we're gonna hopefully have it as, um, as uh, easy to do that as possible. But, you know, there will be some, you know, uh, maintenance that will be required, but hopefully not too much on your repositories. So a brief overview of the uh, contents of the VRM tools. Um, there's the set of programs that are used to create the grid. Squadgen is the basis of all of them. Uh, then there's a, 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 G, a graphical interface to Squadgen, which is the VRM editor. And then there's a command line version of Squadgen, which is compatible with the VRM editor, which is VRM control volumes. It works you know, pretty much the same way as Squadgen, but just a little bit different. Then there's the sequence of uh, um, input processing uh, programs where you go through once you have your grid, then you have to go through and create all the initial files and all the mapping files and things like that for that grid in order to run the model. Um, and that's the part that's going to change a lot in the in the next release in that uh, those uh, those steps of creating all those files are going to a lot of them, almost all of them are going to go away. And so we're not going to spend time doing that um, so much anymore. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, some the installation grid uh, script, um, some diagnostics that are put in there. And then in the uh, docs directory, there's, uh, you know, PDF, an old PDF version of kind of more thorough documentation. And then I also put in there um, the, um, the demo files from last year's tutorial at the AMWG meeting. And so there's some files in there that uh, you know, users will find useful if they have troubles, they can go there and reference that um, for help. So uh, the whole process, what we do here is we're creating a repository uh, for your new grid, and uh, you're gonna maintain that in some local uh, repository space. And uh, the grids have a, uh, a fixed kind of nomenclature naming convention that we use. And, uh, and so you kind of follow that in making your grid and then fill out the, these uh, directories with your, your grid information. And then um, that's what you use to uh, run your models. So uh, like I said, we're, you know, we're gonna go into great detail. So these are you know, some of the resources um, that uh, are available for previous stuff. Um, you know, we're not gonna duplicate too much of it, I don't think. Um, but you know, so if you, if you have any questions, you can reference them. And I think most people have already gone through and looked at those uh, those resources in the previous tutorial and documentation. So uh, the uh, grid creation programs. Uh, so uh, the main program I said is uh, Squadgen. It's a command line program. And uh, these programs generate what is called the NE part of the spectral element grid. So a spectral element is kind of the, you know, the grid that you see here but then when we actually run the model, a, a, a higher resolution template or your know, grid is, uh, is put on top of that. So, you know, this is the coarse version of it. And then there's going to be a four by four grid that's, you know, uh, laid on, you know, on top of each one of these elements eventually. So the work we're working on the, on the coarse part of the grid right now. And so Squadgen, its method was you basically create a PNG image and uh, of, of a, a outline of the region that you're going to refine. Then that uses um, that image and creates um, a a discrete um, cube grid. And so each one of these elements is assigned an integer value that defines its refinement, and then that is what's used to do, to um, create the grid. And because it is discrete that way, so there's going to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can't have, you know, everything can't be exactly smooth. So you have to deal with that, um, you know, that discrete nature of the grid. Um, so when you run, if, so uh, the Squad Gem program um, you know, has a bunch of command line options. And once you compile it, if you just run it with the no arguments, it'll list them out. And uh, one of the advantages that uh, Squadgen has had for, for uh, forever is that uh, the ability to um, uh, do some uh, fine detail editing of the grid once you have the course outline of it laid out. 
And uh, so when you run Squadgen, it puts out a file that has puts out the cube, the discrete cube uh, values into an ASCII file. And then if you edit that file, you can pass it back to Squadgen and clean up your grid. And that was kind of the method that Squadgen has used. And so when you go through, you know, and the file has you know a, a fixed structure, so it's not too hard to kind of find the face that you're you're interested in and the region. You know your your region, and you, you can notice the ones and the twos standing out from all the zeros. So you can kind of figure out where your your grid is at, and then clean up the perimeter by you know changing those values uh, to a nice uh, uniform distribution. Uh, the VR editor, on the other hand, takes a different approach. Rather than using an image, um, you, we edit a a reference a refinement map, which is um, uh, you know, values between zero and one, and those are on a lat long grid. And you use the editor to kind of uh, go through and, and um, make the regions that you want to have highly refined one, and then you know, the, the, the base resolution is zero, and uh, you can uh, edit that that way um, to set those um, continuous values. And then those continuous values are then discretized onto the to create the discrete values on the cube grid. And then that's what's used uh, to create your um, your final grid that you see. And so the interface is you know it has a, a, a toolbox on the right side for um, for the um, controlling the arguments to Squadgen. Um, has an edit tab for doing the editing, and then there's a display tab for changing what you view. And then down at the bottom, there's a, a set of grid information that's produced for each grid that is generated, and you can use that um, to. Uh, identify where you know like the, the extreme uh, elements are at and maybe zoom in and look at them and see you know what corrections maybe you can make to uh, clean up those elements. So when you're doing this editing process because it is a continuous value you know you have to kind of think about okay how many refinement levels do I have and then you have to figure out well what values do you have set to uh, specify um, each um, refinement level and so uh, if we have a any 30 with grid with uh, any 240 refinement. There are four levels, uh, sorry, three levels. And so um, the refinement level is three. And so there are kind of resolution of these continuous values is 0.33. And so we kind of you know uh, set our values so that values that, for example, at the any 120 that are between 0.5 and 8.3, when the um, element, cube element gets averaged, Whatever value comes out, if it's in that range of 0.5 to 83, then that gets assigned in any 120 refinement level on the discrete grid. And now, uh, and then, you know, uh, the standalone program is very similar to, oh, one thing that is different between these is that the, um, the rotation angles of the grid, and this is a, a key difference between Squadgen and the VRM editor interface, is that the rotation angles are applied, and these are the Euler angles of the rotation. Um, they're applied before the refinement is applied, is, is applied. And for squad gen, the refinement is applied and then you rotate that refinement into position. So it's kind of, you know, there's a sequencing difference between the two. And that is why um, there had to be a separate create VRM, VRM grid program in the first place uh, to accommodate those differences. Um, one thing that is uh, the new option that is in the create VRM VRM grid is there's a new option refined cube, which uh, will now take in the um, those uh, the uh, discrete uh, cube file, you know the ASCII file that you can edit, um, and so now the, the create VRM grid can have, share you know um, take it you know has the same advantages that the Squadgen program has in terms of being able to make manual edits for fine detailed corrections to your to your grid uh, domains. And uh, all of these programs, when they're done, they output a uh, an Exodus file uh, that contains the information about the the, the cube uh, uh, refinements. So those, you know, in terms of so when we go through, we're creating grids. You're going to create a number of grids in this first process. Uh, the Exodus grid, as I said, is just uh, the discrete um, or you know the the uh, the grid that's on the on each cube face. So for an any 30, there's 30 by 30 uh, elements. And that's what the Exodus file, you know, kind of shows here over South America. And then once that Exodus file is created, 
then the gen control volumes program goes through and creates um, two other grids. Uh, the script uh, grid uh, contains the spectral element grid points, and then it has uh, polygonal regions associated with each point and the corresponding area weight that's assigned to that point based on that, uh, those polygonal regions. Uh, the lat-lon file, uh, if you look in there, you see that it just has the same lat-lon and area values that you find in a typical uh, history file, but it also has uh, connectivity information that um, is used for um, connecting, you know, for, for graph, it takes, it's good for graphing so that you can uh, um, take each quad and, and assign a value based on, on the grid point values and, and, and graph them uh, more readily. Once those files are created, then the, you, we're going to create a mesh file. And this is kind of the new uh, thing that's going to come in here is a mesh file is an enhanced version of a script file with it has additional information uh, for optimizing EAE. Oh, that's a mistype over there. ESMF uh, mapping functions. Um, and the, that's going to be what's going to re, so replace the need to do all of the um, initial file interpolations because we're going to have this mesh file and the ESMF uh, mapping is going to happen uh, seamlessly at startup. So uh, when we create the grids, um, there's two different uh, refinement types that we can apply. Um, there's what's called the qubit type uh, refinement. And what that does is it uses a set of templates the size of the lower resolution grid in order to transition to the next higher resolution. And the, you know, the set of templates is kind of shown here and you can kind of see how they they stitch together the two domains of differing uh, uh, resolutions. The uh, locon option is a uh, refinement type that rather than going uh, being over one grid element of the lower resolution, it uses a set of templates that span the two by two set of elements at the lower resolution in order to transition to a higher resolution in a more, uh, you know, a less um, um, abrupt way. Uh, so it kind of smooths out or stretches out the transition over a, a larger domain. So uh, we the new features that uh, are uh, we're going to uh, show today is one is it was actually it was it's not a new feature it's just something that you know um, you know I only some only some people know about it um, but uh, I made a program for changing resolutions of the refinement map. Um, because the more users that have in difficulty when they're trying to uh, refine a, a very small region to a high level of, uh, of resolution, um, the uh, resolution of the uh, refinement map in the editor is, is too coarse and they don't have enough detail to, to make the regions nicely. Um, so there's a program there, Gen Ref Map, NCL. And uh, you edit that and you can, uh, what it does is it basically creates a, an empty refinement map, but at a higher resolution. And then once the um, VRM editor, if you read that refinement map in, it will adapt and reallocate memory uh, at the higher resolution. And then you can uh, make finer detailed edits uh, to, your, to your maps or to your grids. Uh, in the editor tab, there's uh, new fill options for the polygon and rectangle editors. Um, there's a fill all, a fill max val, and a fill min val. Fill all will take whatever re, you know, uh, region for the polygon, for example, and whatever value set, the entire um, interior of that uh, polygon is going to be set to that value. The fill max value will compare what's in the reference map already and your value, and it will only um, apply the maximum of those two values. And similarly for the min value, um, the, uh, it'll take the minimum of those two values and replace the values in, in that. So these options give the ability to kind of sculpt uh, the, um, the domains of your uh, continuous refinement values in order to get the, the, um, the discrete grid to round up or down um, in a different direction. And that gives the ability to edit and clean up uh, little blemishes in your grids. Um, and then uh, the manual editing uh, uh, process the VRM editor now has a write refinement. Um, I, I, it's a typo, it's grid on the program. It should be cube. I'll fix that sooner or later. So write refinement cube. So that will save the, um, the ASCII file containing the um, cube of refinement levels. 
And then you can edit that um, in an editor with like VI, for example, to go through and change the discrete values to suit your needs, and then pass that into the create VR mark, VR, ERM grid and generate your final Exodus uh, grid. So the, uh, so the VRM editor, I'll move this out of the way. So we start up our, the editor here. Um, uh, excuse me, let's get at this out of the way. Okay, so when we start up our editor, we have our, our toolbox up to the right. So, in, you know, the um, settings, you know, the uh, values available for the um, squad gen are still the same here and display is the same. In the edit uh, section, <clears throat> if we edit in here, we see that the polygon editor now has this fill option here. And then the rectangle op has fill all here. And then <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my top bar here or not, but in the actions menu, you pull down and there's re write refinement grid here. We'll generate the ASCII file uh, of the uh, discrete cube uh, refinement values. So if we start out here, so, um, so you know, there was a number of, uh, of uh, listed regions that people are interested in. And uh, you know, Michigan caught my eye because that is a case, for example, that uh, we, you know, maybe we want to have a really high resolution grid, but it's on a very small domain. And, uh, and so that's kind of like, you know, been a challenge. So we're going to maybe uh, have a look at that and I'll give an example of how uh, the new features can be used for something like that. Um, <clears throat> so, for, uh, so we're going to start out with, uh, let's say we have, we want to have a, um, oops. A refinement of uh, of a base resolution of any thirty, and we want to refine that down to uh, three kilometers uh, over Michigan. So always the first step is we want to try and center um, our our cube face over the region that we're interested in. And so for Michigan, if we set a value of uh, if we rotate forty in X here and 1.5 in longitude and generate the grid. Then we can kind of zoom in. And find Michigan. So we have here a nice send is centered up nicely. And uh, if we want to edit a grid, so we say go ahead and edit and uh, go ahead and use the polygon editor reset the values and then say we want to have our high resolution region just really localized around Michigan and the Great Lakes. And as always when we do that, you know, we try and follow the uh, the grid lines of the uh, cube because it's uh, gives us a good behavior in the refinement. So here we're gonna fill this value with one and then exit and say, yes. Oh, let's go back. So if you look here, you can see all these the kind of aliasing. So this is the resolution of the, of the refinement map that we're seeing here. And it kind of has this, this discrete structure here. So if we uh, go ahead and exit there and then Save those values, go back here. We're gonna just go with the low con. We're gonna go with five levels of refinement. Put on a little bit of smoothing and then generate our grid. You see we have our grid and uh, Yon has these little blemishes here. Um, but if we try to um, edit and fix those blemishes, you know, then we, um, uh, end up with a, uh, excuse me while I do this wrong. Um, we, you know, it's, it's difficult to get these values to, to round down. So um, if we go to the read refinement here and, oh, see that. 
So if we read refinement map, I have uh, some of these set up here. Um, I'm going to read in a 1440 by 720. I created a, 280, a 2280 by 1440 grid when I did this demo. You know, I worked out this demo, um, but then when I went to actually use it um, on my laptop here, it turns out that um, this is too much for um, my laptop to handle. Um, the data, is, this values are read in um, using um, uh, automatic arrays off of it takes memory off the stack and so uh, it works great for casper or um and uh, a workstation at the higher resolution but if i try to read in the 280 2880 grid um it'll just crash because it'll have a segmentation fault so we're gonna have to kind of make do with the smaller the lower resolution grid so if we go through and the edit process now if i go to edit I've read in a map, so what I had there before is gone. So we had those kind of discrete structures. But if I just apply the map again, we can see that we have a little bit more um, detail in our in our map. And so uh, that makes uh, and then if, yeah, so it gives us fine higher detail. And then if we exit the editor and generate the grid. I guess this, did I read it in? I think maybe you didn't apply after you read it. Yeah. Maybe I already had the high resolution in there, so I didn't show it. I was playing with it before. Okay, so yeah, so it gives you a uh, greater control, but you know, so the so I have the 1440. And so an alternate approach. So if you, you know, in terms of um, changing the resolution of the um, refinement map is uh, that you can um, uh, change the base resolution and that get, it can also give you uh, greater control. So rather than having any 30 with four or five refinements, we can have an any any 60 grid. with four refinements. And then, uh, still thinking. No, I lost my place in my notes here. So I wanna, I was gonna start over on a, on a base grid of, of any 60 and then now go here. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and start. So we have a higher resolution map is initialized and so now we can go back and re-edit here. So if I um, uh, just go ahead and reset that to zero. And now um, reset my polygon. Now this is a any 60 grid, so I'm gonna get aligned with it a little bit better to start with. So we have four regions and so uh, you know, our, 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 the levels of, of the refinement that we have are going to be, you know, in um, <clears throat> uh, you know, it has an increment of, of refinement of, of refinement values of 0.25. And so if we have four regions, um, we can set the um, initial one to uh, value of one. And then if we want to have a halo at the next lower resolution, um, you know, the, uh, we're going to have, we're going to set a value of 0.7 out here on, the, on this resolution. Now, so I fill all if I just clicked it now, it would just replay, it would erase that. So I want to just do fill max val. So it'll take the max of 0.7 and here the max of 0.7 and 0.1 is one. So I'll leave this old region alone and we'll just add the 0.7 values around the perimeter. So if I apply it like that, then I can work my way out the next refinement level. I'm just gonna give it a value of 0.45. Okay, so you're always going, so there's four uh, refinement levels. And so the boundaries are 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1.0. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you don't yeah. want to, you want to make sure you're not, at, you're going 0.5 lower than the boundary to make sure that you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you want to be right on the two resolutions. Yeah. Because so that's it, why you're, yeah. you're doing 0.7 instead of 0.75 to make yeah. sure that you're not straddling two resolutions. Okay. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And then, so same thing there. So I'm going to 0.5. And then this here. And when it comes down to is you know you're setting these the the um, the real values of R here and then you know the four points of each element get added together and averaged and whatever that average value does wherever it lands up that's the the discrete refinement level that gets assigned to that that element and so you're kind of like trying to play a game of you know this you know what's the average of these values um, and so here I'm just going to set point two. So if I exit out of here, say yes, go to the VRM editor. And so I have a 60 for refinements. I'm gonna look on and generate the cube. So we can see here that uh, the did a pretty good job of hitting that. We've got this little air, this little blemish here. So now we can go through in the editor and say, okay, we want to get rid of that. And you can see that, you know, so this little bump here is kind of causing the, uh, the discrete value to round up. And so uh, actually, if we go through over here, uh, get the grid out of the way, we can look. So that this is our, our real values between zero and one. This is a set of discrete values that's actually used to create uh, the grid. And so if you look here, you can see there's this little bump here where it rounded up. And so we want to get rid of this little bump here to make this a, a more uniform uh, domain. So what we're doing is um, we're going to go through the editor and just kind of reset this value here. And we can kind of move this in place. What we want to do is you just want to trim off that little bump a little bit to try and get that um, the green area to round down. So in this case here, I've got, this is the 0.7 domain. So I'm going to set this to 0.7 and I want to have um, the what I when I apply this I want it to replace these values of one here with 0.7. So I'm going to say here I'm going to say um, fill with the min value. So min value there's nothing's going to happen here, but here where it's one and 0.7 it's going to replace the one with 0.7. So you click on apply. So I applied it and you know if you look nothing happened. So what that means is I I'm not getting enough to um, to get it to round down. So if I apply it again, nothing. Uh, let's go to one more. So I'm, I'm kind of being conservative because if you overshoot it, then you have to go back and fix what you did. But you know, good thing is that you can undo anything that you've done wrong, but you don't want to make work for yourself in the process. But this is getting monotonous here. Let's try this one. I just love it when things work great when you're practicing all night long and then when you go to your <laughs> demo, it's like it doesn't work. I, I saw it move a little bit. Yeah, let's see if it let's see if it did something here. So generate the bar mesh. Yeah, not yet. So let's go here. Let's just move this whole thing down the tad. Why? There we go. All right. So now it changed. So now we're going to exit. Say yes. You're a manager. Apply it. And there. Hey. See, we got rid of it. So nice. now we can go down here. So then we, we like this perimeter here. We don't like this, and we definitely don't like that. So we can go into edit, so play the same game. So here we want to add, extend this 0.7 region a little bit farther down here to get this to round up, and then make it stick out in the, in the corner here a little bit more to also get it to round up. So in, the, in all this process, so you know the reset button here is, you know will get you that your little rectangle back. Um, I always hated that, you know, I made it like a well, fixed size, but 
I'm actually getting used to it being a thick size, you know, because it can get like a, you know, these circles give them a nice big handle for moving things around. Uh, but it does get kind of hard to see things at times. So let's see if we can do two things at once. So let's kind of make this region over here. Yeah, I always get scared by the reset button. So that actually doesn't erase anything. It just gives you a fresh new polygon. Is that right? Yeah, this reset button here is will erase everything. So when you go up here, this reset button will set everything to zero. Um, for the polygon editor, it just resets the poly, you know, the initial rectangle in your field of, at the center of your field of view. Okay, gotcha. All right, so here we're, we want to do, we can do fill all because all of our points are within this region here. Um, or, you know, if we happen to be like up here, you know, depending, you know, sometimes we just use the uh, polygon as it sets. So here we just, we can do fill max, apply. So it moved that corner down. It didn't do anything here yet. So it's going to, it's going to be a little bit more aggressive with this one. Bring this down and apply this. All right, we've got a little bit of movement there. So exit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it can be slow, but, you know, sometimes baby steps are, are better. And so we go back to, so we fixed this here, but it didn't fix this here. But if we go back to edit, our polygon still is just sitting there. So we can just kind of move this down a little bit, make it go a little bit more, see if we can get a little bit more movement out of this. Uh, here, okay, let's see what that did. Yes, here, uh, generate. And so we can go through this process. Um, it gives a way of kind of going systematically around your grid and uh, finding the things that are wrong and fixing them. And so this right here, I think, you know, uh, I think that's it for, so there, yeah, so that's all of them there. So that would be our grid. Uh, there. So we would, you know, generate our uh, Exodus file and move on to the rest of uh, the program. So that's a, uh, an example of that. Um, so another example is because um, we always try and have our, um, our domain, you know, kind of centered on a cube face, but that's not always going to be possible. Um, one particular example is um, a colleague of ours is uh, working on a uh, tropical belt refinement where he has a high re uh, a refined region across uh, the equator. And so there's no way you can have that uh, confined um, to uh, a single cube face. So you're gonna have to cross that boundary with, uh, with um, uh, your refinement and then you know, deal with the uh, problems that you know are so that arise from that. And so let me just go ahead and generate uh, his initial grid. We'll reset everything here. That zero. I guess these somewhat don't matter. And he had no smoothing qubit, and he was just doing an NE two forty refinement. And so we generate that. Reset our view, so he has a nice, uh, you know, band across the equator. But um, even with uh, aggressive uh, settings for the time stepping and the splits, um, this this grid will not run for five days. You know, and, and uh, you know, he's been uh, he, he, they tried a lot, and they went really you know beyond what would be reasonable to try and run uh, production run at. And it, this grid just, you know, has difficulties. And, you know, if you look in here, you can see, you know, how it, there's all these irregular jumps along the latitude circles as, you know, it crosses the grid lines of the cube face. Um, so um, if we go to uh, Locon, for example, here, we can say, okay, let's generate that. And that kind of like, well, it's like, in a sense, it kind of makes it worse, you know, because like, you know, now they got these big bumps, you know, and across as a function of latitude. And if we zoom in here, I want to show something real quick here. So we can see here kind of our, you know, the templates that are used by Locon. And if you look in here at this corner right here, See this element, see how small that element is? So we have, this is our finest resolution, 
but these elements here are smaller than that resolution. So these are going to be kind of controlling um, the stability of, of our model. And so this, the size of these elements, you know, we want the smallest elements, we would really like them to be in the high refined region, not in the, you know, associated with the transition uh, around it. So this is a case here where um, the spring smoothing can help that out. So I apply the spring smoothing, get my cursor out of the way, you can see it kind of makes those areas bigger. Um, but, you know, it is a, uh, it's a diminishing return. So if I change these, um, the iteration, the length to higher values, it's really not going to change this that much. So there's only so much you can, you can do um, with these here. So that's the question. So, you know, what are you going to do? So you have, um, um, and so right, well, what he's trying now is we, we you know, he's going to try these, uh, some of these, these grids with the smoothing on there because he had no smoothing on his see if he can get um, his grids to run um, at least for the five days, but it's probably gonna be a bit more expensive um, than if we were following along grid lines and had nice transitions that were kind of nice and continuous uh, uh, along the grid lines. So this is kind of a trade-off that uh, is gonna happen. So you're gonna have, um, you know, you're gonna have these a, a grid like this, and maybe you're gonna have to have um, you know some higher or some shorter time stepping and, and greater slip cycling to get it to run stably. Um, but at least the refinement is kind of a uniform function of latitude. Um, so, and then there's the alternative would be okay. So follow the grid lines, but then um, you know if we can do that, and maybe we can go through that example here. So we go through the edit and. Uh, that's Brian's grid there. So if we just kind of go through and say, make this 11. Are these crashing in aqua planets or is it, or was he able to get aqua planet to run? I think, yeah, I'm not sure. Did he get aqua planet? Um, it's not clear. I think he was, they were trying to move off aqua planet. So he may have gotten it to work with aqua planet. And actually that's what it was. And um, uh, because the ITCZ is moving, you know, plus or minus 20 degrees over a seasonal cycle in a non op planet. So it would be, ITCZ would be going in and out of this refinement region. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, well, I'm not sure what the, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I don't know if he's, you know, he's, I think he's putting in topography, but, you know, I don't know what, he, what he's, you know, I don't know the details, what Brian's doing um, in, in great detail. Uh, but, um, yeah, well, I'll I, show. I, I, Later, that refining the ITC TZ is 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 particularly challenging. Yeah, when yeah. you have a lot of diabetic heating and large vertical velocities that are very sensitive to the local grid resolution. Um, so that's part of the problem. If you were to do this on the North Pole, I suspect it would run. And that part of the problem is your it's because the ITC TZ is very scale sensitive, resolution yeah. sensitive. Yeah, and so yeah, and, and I don't know if he was going to play with it because he had the tapering in there and the, within latitude. So um, I don't know if this was a first start for him, but um, but yeah, it's uh, you know the, yeah, it's what, you know what can you do with a refined grid and what can't you do? I think it's a question that people are going to be kind of like you know going back and forth with. You know, it's like there's going to be limitations, and then you know this is probably one of them where you know are you really getting anything useful out of refining the equator? Uh, equatorial region like this here. Um, but one thing that, uh, you know, he did come across and I, when I was in there doing all the code changes, I forgot to fix it. So if I went to create a, uh, a rectangular region, and so he says, okay, I want it to go across the entire zonal region. So I set zero, 360, and I have a plus or minus 11 degree kind of band of high resolution here. Um, and he clicks apply and the map is zero. It's because zero and 360 are mapped to the same point um, in the way I'm doing things. So you have to kind of go uh, minus one to 361, and then you apply, and then you can, all right, so now that's, you know, now we have our region. So, um, so yeah, so go ahead okay, and exit no. there, save that, go to the editor, um, and go ahead and generate that. And, so this is, you know, getting rid of his taper. So this is kind of a starting point here. So we have, you know, these, these jumps here. So, um, 
So what can we do? So uh, if we go in, go to our polygon editor and say, all right, so let's just see if we want to follow along um, the grid lines. So we can kind of go through here and, uh, oh, I didn't want to do that. We just take our editor and polygons and just kind of make a little arc that goes through across here. There. <coughs> Excuse me. So apply. And then you know we have to do this on on uh, all four cube faces. So if I hold the polygon and I kind of shift the map underneath of it, I can kind of easily move to the next region, and then get it lined up in greater detail. Apply, and we'll do the same thing here. Okay, and apply. Let's just go go back. Now, if I want to, uh, we have a two element halo. Along here, I'm going to set these values here. Just, you know, we have three refinement levels. So it's just kind of go with uh, right in the middle, six, six, apply. Yeah. Same thing for that region. And then if we go up here, add a point three three apply. Isn't three three and six six right at this? straddling two resolution boundaries when you have three refinement levels might be let's see what happens yeah i um i was looking at my notes and then i caught the wrong number so uh, I, no I actually no it isn't so yeah no it caught the right number so what happens is um because the highest level and the lowest level are kind of there's four you know you have to have the endpoints. so there's three domains but there's four points so the highest and lowest levels are split by two so the boundaries are at 0 0.16, 0 0.49, and 0 0.84. So yeah, the, the 6.6 and 3.3 are in the centers of those. Um, so then if I'm not gonna do the whole thing here, so we can kind of just start here. Um, I did, all right, so let's, let's generate the grid. Doesn't show up because I changed this in the display. And so we zoom out and uh, so then we see again, there's these blemishes that kind of occur here and along here. And we can go through the same process as we did, as I showed with the, uh, the Michigan grid that uh, we can go in the editor and then just kind of reset and go through and just uh, kind of line up our polygon here. Gonna get inside this domain here. So Patrick, I thought you were gonna use this to say, you know, early just a few minutes ago, I thought you were gonna say, well, this just can't really be done. There's some definitely some limitations, but I think you're showing that if you're patient enough, you can do just about anything. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I, I Yes, it, um, you know what I was saying is that, uh, I don't know if there was, used to be a show on PBS called The Joy of Painting. Um, uh, this guy, Bob Ross, and he, he would always make this joke about, you know, and it was like he had this wet and wet painting technique that he would talk about. And he's like, I was talking about having to get out his one hair brush to make fine detail corrections to his paintings. So it's kind of like painting a portrait with a one hair brush. Um, so, all right, I'm not going to fiddle with this too much because I did spend all the time to do all that. So I'll just kind of read in the answer. Um, and uh, 
where did I put it? It's this one here. So I'll open that one and I'll reset my display. Generate the mesh. It's overcast in Boulder, just so everyone knows. <laughs> Don't move here. <laughs> so you can get a nice, a nice uniform. You go through this process, and you get a nice uniform transition relative to the cube faces. But then you end up with a scenario where um, you have a wave number four variation of refinement in latitude. And so the question you have to ask yourself when you're making these grids is, you know, if I had a high resolution um, uh, domain, you know, uh, 12 kilometer uh, do, uh, model, and I put in for some reason, I don't know why, but I put in a filter uh, on the poles that uh, reduced the variability of, of the prognostic variables by a factor of eight. And then I applied that. And then for some reason, I also had that uh, filter have a wave number four variation in latitude, you know, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, would I expect that filter to have an impact on what I'm seeing at the equator, you know, and so, you know, if the trade off is, is um, this will run, I expect, you know, much more economically and efficiently, but will the answer, how will the answer be affected by the fact that you have greater resolved variability, you know, in the center of the cubes at some, certain latitudes than at the cube edges. And you know what's the relation of that to say a convective center like you know if you're over the Amazon or, you know or you know if you're over Africa or the maritime continent here you know uh, you know what you know if you change the phase of this you know how does that change your answer you know if, if you know, well if you change the phase you have to re-edit everything <laughs> never mind <laughs> but uh, you know but if you if you moved you know that region then um, you know, what, what impact is that going to have, you know, in terms of your scientific results, you know, that's just stuff that you have to, uh, to take into consideration. So, all right, so that's just kind of this process here. And so and when the actions menu, like I said, when you're done, you write your Exodus file. And if you have, um, so because this, you know, can be a tedious process, um, you know, there are advantages to manually editing to create your halos, because, you know, you're sitting there fiddling with this thing, trying to get it to round up and down. Um, you know, as, you know, in you know, a number of cases, it'd be easier just to write out the ASCII file of the cube, go find those places, and then edit that file and clean those up. And so that's what Adam is going to go through the process of showing uh, people how to do that um, uh, now. So I think that uh, so I'll stop sharing, and then Adam, you can kind of go through the uh, the next step of uh, how to manually edit. Um, yeah. The cube yeah. Um, yeah. Let me share my screen and. Um, host has disabled participant sh screen sharing. I think you have to enable it. The sh oh, whoever's the host, I think it's Louise. Oh. You don't have you don't have the ability to share. Sorry. It's yeah. I, Louisa has to give me permissions. Make you co-host. Oh, there we go. I'm a I'm a co-host. So that that oh. works. Open. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, let me get rid of this thing. That's in the way. We'll start at ground zero here and load up uh, VNC Tiger so that we can um, open up the GUI on Casper. So, I'm going to go into Casper. The Sizzle web has um, just recently reorganized all of their web pages. So I don't know, there may be other links on the Musica wiki that um, are broken. Um, so just let me know and do some searching on the Sizzle web page. Everything should still be there just under this new arc.ucar.edu link. Um. Oh, okay. So it needs me to put in a project account. That's no problem. Just waiting for the scheduler here. Hopefully this will just go right through. I got real nervous when I got the email you said they were going to 
do maintenance on Casper this morning at nine o'clock, but it was just for the uh, the GPUs. So. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna use this tunnel option. Use a new terminal, pop it in. Okay, now I'm gonna open up Tiger. Pa pa pa. I'm going to use this local host. Connect. Pop in the password. All right. So now we need to go to the terminal. Okay. And now I'm going to go into QRM tools. So I have the latest version of VRM editor and we'll execute the GUI. Uh -huh. So um, let's see, I'm just gonna do um, a very simple refinement of just um, one panel face. So I'll just choose the equatorial panel face. Um, so I'm going to create a polygon and uh, Zooming in, uh, Patrick, uh, how do I do that? Uh, wheel mouse or your pincher things if you're on a Mac, but it's the wheel mouse, the wheel uh, will zoom in. Oh, pinch. Wait, hold on. Well, I don't have a wheel mouse. The I way can... you would scroll, however you would scroll up. Oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> so there we go, scrolling down. Perfect. So I just, the goal is just to refine this one cube face. Ideally, I don't want it bleeding into the other cube faces, um, but it will do that as this, um, because I'm gonna use Locon and Locon um, is not as easy to manipulate as Qubit because it has, it requires a two by two uh, of the course's element as its templates to building blocks. Okay, um, apply all to the highest resolution. I'm gonna exit, save. I'm gonna go to display and just turn it back on. It's nice, I like seeing it. Um, radio Locon. We're just gonna do two doublings. Uh, so base resolution 9030, that's one degree. So we're gonna double it. Uh, two doublings will give you a quarter degree in there. And I'm just gonna do it. So that's pretty ugly and it's gonna require a lot of fine tuning. So I um, mean, Patrick outlined ways you can do it with the GUI editor, but I'm gonna show you how you can do this by manually editing the ASCII file. Um, so let's turn this off so we can see it in all its glory. So I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write an Exodus file. And, and the only reason I'm writing an Exodus file is because it memorializes the options um, that, that you chose to make this grid. Um, and so some of those options we're gonna wanna feed into the command line. So it basically, the only reason I'm writing an Exodus is to create a record of all the options I used to create the script. So I'm gonna write an Exodus file to grids. I'll call it one panel Exodus. Let's see. Okay. Now I'm gonna save the refinement map, which is just um, NetCDF, I believe. Yes. Um, and so we'll call this prime map. Okay. 
And now I'm gonna save the refinement grid, which is the ASCII file. Um, and we'll call it grid, and I'm gonna label it as a .dat file. Okay. So I'm gonna exit the editor and I am gonna go um, into Linux. Okay, so I'm in the VR editor path and go into source. Um, the GUI is VRM editor, um, the GUI. And so what we wanna do is the command line version, which is called create VRM grid. So I already compiled this. Um, and so as is good practice when you're running a command line, I wish this thing would move out of my way. We can't see whatever it is. Yeah, we can't see it, Adam, <laughs> whatever it is. Oh. <laughs> okay. So yeah, as with any command line program, the first thing you wanna do is either just execute it without arguments or dash dash help, tell you what, you, what this thing wants. So it wants all of, um, some of these are optional parameters. Um, um, and so um, things such as X rotate, oh, that looks like a typo, um, Patrick. Should, one of these should say Y rotate. <laughs> um, this is how we debug. Um, so I didn't do any rotations. Um, and so I'm not going to fill these out, but had I done rotations, those would have been memorialized in the Exodus file. Um, refine level, and I remember it was two, but just to show you, let's go ahead and grab that out of the Exodus file. So I'll nc dump dash h to see what's in the Exodus file. Um, and you can see the rotation parameters are right here. Um, and so what I want is this variable, VRM refinement. I believe that will tell me, that should tell me, uh, should spit out a value of two. Let's see if it does. All the values that are in there uh, have a VRM underscore uh, pre, you know, a header to them. So you can find them in the Exodus file. Okay, so all of these are VRM underscores. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to the arguments required by create PRM grid. Um, I'm actually going to go out back into the grids directory where I have most of the things I want to actually call into uh, the command lines. So then this is like this. And create. Well, let's make sure that's right. Okay. Okay, so the first uh, flag I wanna define is the refine type, I'm gonna go low con. Um, don't need to tell it what type of grid type, it'll default to cube sphere, I guess. Yes. Smooth type, uh, none, not smoothing. Base resolution is gonna be 30. Um, refine level we just saw is two. Um, da, 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 no rotation parameters. Okay, so refine file. This is going to be that net CDF. One panel. Refine map. So that refine file is the refinement map. Um, and then this is the ASCII file. Refine cube. Um, so that's one panel. Um, grid dot dot and output um, call this uh, new mesh dot g that's the exodus file name I'm going to give it so I'm going to execute that um, it created new mesh dot g um, I have this ncl script that's available in our toolkit called grid plot that ncl and it's automatically going to plot the grid named new mesh dot g so I'm going to plot that. Okay. 
Okay, and then let me just open up that PDF and just make sure that it duplicated the grid that I made in the GUI, which has all the blemishes and it's quite ugly. So the map is Okay, so there it is in all its ugly glory. Um, the grid plot spits out a cylindrical equidistant and a orthographic. So we want to we want to fix this. Um, so let's look at the Aussie file. Uh, one panel define grid. Okay, and so the Aussie file is the six faces of the cube sphere grid. Um, and so what you'll notice is there is uh, 30 columns. Um, okay, and so, and then there's going to be 180 rows of zeros. And so basically these are all cube faces stacked on top of each other. So if I go down to line 30, um, this encapsulates the entire um, cube face one. Um, using the base resolution, any 30 coordinates. Um, so Patrick showed this plot from um, Ellen Rhodes. That sort of gives you a, a schematic of how these, how this dot, how these Aussie files are laid out. And I get it. It's just all of these cube panels stacked on top of each other. And this is how they are numbered. So Q panel one would be over, you know, the prime meridian equatorial panel, blah, blah, blah. So this is the, the basic layout of the Zosky file. All six of these panels just stacked up on top of each other. So if I, if I scroll down, I can find um, the face that I tried to uh, refine and you can see it right there. So this is, um, this is face, uh, three and the end of phase three is here. And then you can see all these ones and zeros that are bleeding over into the other faces. So the first thing you wanna do is I never, I never wanted those, I never wanted it to bleed into another cube face. So for sure, uh, I'm going to zero these all out. So just be another couple minutes. I know it seems like I'm doing things very monotonously, but you will see how quick this gets done as soon as I get rid of these blemishes. It's faster than one hairbrush. It's right, exactly. Bob Ross would be like, this is too quick. Um, and then I saw up here some ones that don't belong. Um, so let's get rid of these. Okay, so now the problem is all contained to the one cube face in the ASCII file. And I mean, already you can see that this is gonna cause problems. You got refine level twos at the right boundary of that equatorial panel. And that inevitably is gonna bleed over into other panels because you need, it'll try to create a, a transition zone that goes from zero through one to two. And especially since I'm using LOCON, um, what you actually wanna do, if you wanna contain your refinement to just one panel, and since LOCON works with these sort of two by two uh, coarse elements, in all reality, you're going to have to actually have some zeros in that panel you want to refine if you want to contain all the refinement to just that panel. Um, and so I'm going to cheat. I'm going to show you what the ideal solution looks like. And I'm just going to copy it in. Okay. 
a lower con. So these are the cheat sheets for my Arctic grids. And so this is what a panel needs to look like in order to contain it to this one, one panel using low con. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back into one panel. Grid. Okay, and again, this is 60 columns or 30 columns of zeros and 180 rows of zeros. And I'm going to do something daring. I'm going to start deleting lines. And that's why I just told you how many rows there are, because when I delete them, I want to make sure I'm going to put back in the exact same amount. Okay, so now I'm going to paste uh, the correct solution. Okay, I'm going to make sure that at the end of the file still is 180 lines. It is. And this um, should give us a nice looking refinement panel, a nice looking Exodus grid. So let's re execute the command. It's reading in the Aussie file here that I updated. Okay, I'm going to plot it. Um, significantly fewer elements than the first iteration. Okay, and so then you can see we now have a very pretty uh, refinement region contained to entirely just this panel. It's not bleeding over. Um, so that um, is how you do that. And um, so there's many, many different ways in which you can, you can fix blemishes. And this is just one way um, because I'm not so great with the GUI, although I'm learning as, because I was paying attention to Pat very closely. But, um, so yeah, what do you want to go from here, Pat? Just, just Are you going to show the, uh, the problems with the animation and the transition? I think that was a good Yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll um, go Before ahead. we go on, I have one question and maybe, um, Everybody's been very quiet. They can type questions into the chat, but um, if anyone else has questions, um, they can also raise their hands. I had one question about what's the difference between the refinement map net CDF file and the ASCII file? They're not, they don't have the same contents. And then when you run create VRM grid, it doesn't matter that the net CDF file doesn't, isn't really consistent with the ASCII file you just edited? Yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a good question. So it's basically at that point, just adding as a placeholder as an input argument, and it's being overwritten by whatever's in the ASCII file. Um, so that's okay. that's actually how squad gen proper is. You have to, instead of this refine um, map.nc file, you actually have to feed in a PNG file that has um, a schematic representation of where you want to refine in a cylindrical equidistant plot. And it uses the brightness values to do its first guess. And then if you alter the ASCII file that it then outputs, um, and it will override that PNG file. Okay. Um, so it's at that point, it's rendered basically useless. Okay. And one could argue that maybe if you are reading in an ASCII file, you shouldn't need to even put in refine map.nc. But How's that sound? Is that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and yeah, once you edit the file, then yeah, there's the, the refine, the continuous refinement map, the net CDF file is now inconsistent with that because those those um, real values are that are what are used to um, create the discrete uh, uh, refinement cube. So the difference between the two is if you're in the VRM editor, you know, there's like the, the green part where you turn on the, the, the cube, that's what you're seeing with the uh, ASCII file is the green uh, uh, representation. And what you're seeing in the refinement map is the red representation. And so it's just, you know, the green is a discretized version of the red. Um, but once you go through and, and manually edit those discrete values, then the two are, are inconsistent with each other from that point forward. Okay. 
Yeah. And that's kind of like what's been the hang up because I originally, you know, eventually I would like, I would have originally wanted to be able to just edit those values within the editor, but having the consistency between them was kind of like, oh, I don't know how to figure that out right now. So I kind of put it off. Uh, but yeah, so that's, you know, that's what's different between the two. So there's a question in the chart. I'm sorry, Louisa, did you have something to say? No. Okay, sorry. Uh, so Madanki, Madanku, um, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Would creating two separate refined regions add a lot of complexity, I think? Um, and so the answer is it's very straightforward to add two separate refined regions. Um, I think Patrick will show an example that Louisa has put together yeah. where she's refining different regions. Yeah. So no, it, it doesn't make things any much more complex other than yeah. the amount of time you have to spend creating it in the GUI. Yeah. But it, it, just, it kind of depends on where they're at because you want to have, if you want to have them on a cube face, um, you know, uh, if you can rotate the grid so that both regions are within uh, separate cube faces, then that's great. But if you have two regions that don't happen to line up that way, there's no, but you know, well, it's kind of hard. I think even Louise said she had three regions. So we was able to get a rotation that fit that. But I can imagine maybe there's some combination of refinement regions that maybe you can't get both of them onto separate uh, cube faces, or um, or also if they're too close together, they leak into each other. Then there's going to be some issues with how the transition happens because you're transitioning from high resolution to lower resolution, then transitioning right back to high resolution. What that does, you know, we're just going to have to learn as we go. You know, what what if there's any difficulties with that sort of scenario? Yeah, I've I've reviewed a paper where they refined South Asia and then the United States on the same grid. So those are very far apart. So you can have to deal with the problems that Patrick just made clear. So I'm going to show um, uh, just, a, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna just show a couple slides on the importance of having a, a um, I'm sorry, I got a weird prompt just now. Um, so I'm gonna to try to share again. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, you dropped out for a minute, but seems like. Um, am I, can you now see my see, screen? Yeah, yep. now I can see it. Well, that was weird, I got an admin um, password mm -hmm. thing. But if you guys can see everything, that's good, and you can hear me. Yep. Yep. Maybe it was a power. I just had a power spike, so maybe you had that. Well, okay, everything's working now. So, um, I, I often one of the most common critiques I have when people ask me about their grid is I don't think their transition regions are wide enough. Um, and so this is a quick overview on, on why we need that. So I I have two. Um, I guess I can, can you see my shared PowerPoint screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have two grids here where I'm refining the Arctic panel. And the one on the right is a very abrupt transition. And the one on the left is um, a, a gradual transition. Now, for features like gravity waves, um, Waves have their own scale built into the physics, so wave number, whatever. And so those types of features seem to not really care about how sharp the transition region is, because if the resolution changes underneath it as it's propagating away, it's still a wave number three or whatever wave. And so it maintains that. Um, and so I'm going to show you an example where I bomb off, I, I put two bombs at the North Pole that generate these large gravity waves and you'll see them propagating through the transitions. Um, and so I will show that now. So it's bombing right now. And so this is the gravity waves and you can see they maintain their scales as even as they cross over into the one degree region. Show that again. And so this is the abrupt one. This is the gradual one. 
And you can see in both cases, um, the solution looks uh, very reasonable and not being influenced by the amount, uh, the aggressiveness of the refinement. And yeah, it starts to get really cool looking up here after a while. Um, let's wait to see these things slowly go through. Yeah, it's pretty interesting how it keeps its scale even as it goes into the coarser resolution. I would imagine that these really fine, well, like this, this fine one right here might actually just disappear because it can't be supported by any 30. And it looks like it kind of got merged into a larger wave number. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, because the spectral element die core is high order, it's, it's a very stable die core and it can handle um, propagating waves through abrupt transitions. Um, so this next example, I just wanna talk about other types of features, features that tend to actually, so there are lots of features in the model that tend to take on the scale of the finest resolved scale in the model. And those types of features would be very sensitive to the type of transition, um, whether it's gradual or abrupt. Um, and so I'm going to, in a second, show you um, an animation. So if you can imagine, I, I'm gonna show grids that are identical to these, except for the panel that is refined is over the equator. So kind of like the one that I just made using the command line squad gym um, with these two different transitions. And the reason I do it over the equator is because we have a lot of grid scale features. And so it'll illustrate the problems with abrupt transitions um, for those types of features. Um, and so here's an example. The top row is a gradual refinement and the bottom row is aggressive refinement. And I'm just showing a uh, mega 850 in the left, and then the variance of a mega 850 on the right. And this is an aqua planet simulation, so it's a, um, you know, it's 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 always uh, the ITCZ is always at the equator. The solar forcing is always at the equator. It's a perpetual equinox, and in that situation, no tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclones are extremely rare in that aquaplanet configuration because you need the heating to be a little bit off the equatorial, off the equator, so that the Coriolis force is non-zero and you can create cyclones. But what happens when you have really aggressive refinement is as features start to propagate in from the east, the resolution is changing so fast underneath them that these features sort of break into grid scale features and the anomalous circulations associated with that will push these features off the equator. And what you have is these sort of grid induced tropical cyclone tracks. These are tropical cyclone tracks. And so you have these, these, these are grid induced tropical cyclones. And so they're not ideal. And so when you are um, doing this refinement, uh, in particular with the ITCZ, you need, you need to honor gradual uh, refinement transitions or else you're going to get grid-induced circulations, grid-induced tropical cyclones. Um, and uh, there's a paper from Colin Zarziki back in 2014 when he was PhD that shows that you can, with grids like these, you can create um, large-scale circulations from the nested region to the coarse region may just due to aggressive refinement. So you really wanna be careful about that. I think, so I stole this uh, from Bill Skamarak and it's, I think it illustrates the problem fairly well. So one, and one example of a grid scale feature is a front. Um, and so as a front um, starts to propagate into the refinement transition, it's gonna collapse down. And, um, and so you can sort of get these, as they collapse down, they can kind of overshoot and undershoot um, their solution and start creating anomalous circulations due to the refinement. And so he is talking about putting a sponge layer um, 
near the refinement region. I'm, and that's not, I'm using this as a proxy of what happens when you have more gradual refinement. And so for more gradual refinement, your solution would evolve in a um, less steep sort of slope trajectory and arrive at the high resolution solution um, more continuously. And it doesn't have to overshoot or undershoot the solution. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to show the animation of these grid-induced tropical cyclones. Um, so the, this is total precipitable water. I think left is gradual refinement, right is abrupt refinement. And we'll see some of these TCs start to spawn off like here and up here and down here. And that's just because they're overshooting their solution as they, uh, okay, now the Dankton's rotating, but that's fine. Um, this is a plug for NCL, even though NCL is um, not supported, I still think it is a great tool to make nice animations like this. <laughs> um, but again, and these are entirely grid-induced tropical cyclones that you'll see spawning off of the east here. Um, and we'll wait for that to occur and then I'll, okay, over here when there's a big diabetic forcing coming in and then boom, boom. So that's my spiel on um, trying to use gradual transitions. Okay. Is there any questions uh, from folks? Uh, Sergio asked, what's the recommendation for air pollution for transition? I, it's the same. Uh, we have to have the, um, you want the dynamics to be well behaved um, in any simulation, whether you're only looking at meteorology or whether you're looking at atmospheric composition, um, that these um, dynamic artifacts that, Pat, that Adam just showed will have a big impact on atmospheric composition simulations. I think I just wanted, my comment was just to remind everyone that you can't just go into a model run and look at ozone um, because there may be a lot of things hidden in the model simulations and really need to check the meteorology and um, dynamics to make sure there aren't any artifacts there. So, um, I guess that's all uh, for the moment. So you can go back to Patrick who wanted to finish up with a few more slides. Yeah, okay. Um, so here. Hey Adam, I think you're still in control of the screen here. Um, doesn't look I'm like not it. Sharing. I, I, my my bar says I'm viewing Adam Harrington's screen and I can't like. Wait wait wait. I just changed an option. No, no it was one. sorry. Okay. How about now? I don't know why that thing's up there. It's like sometimes when I go to the view, it like disappears, and I have this little green tab. And for some reason, that green tab is like hanging around. So I have two of them, and one of them says I'm viewing your screen, and the other one I just found. So yeah, there we go. Now I can see yours. All right, but I, you know, I'll just look through the other one because it's in my way. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, so we're gonna, uh, you know, so um, in terms of, uh, you know, a summary of best practices when uh, making the grids, uh, we're just gonna kind of go through, you know, kind of the rules of thumb um, that uh, we use when we make our grids. Um, and of course, you know, um, the first one is, you know, we always say is we wanna try and have um, our regions aligned with the uh, rectangular spectral element grid lines uh, because they tend to behave better numerically. And um, it's, you know, sometimes that means, oh, you're going to have more grid points, but it's worth the cost in terms of, you know, you, you have more higher number of grid points, but in the end, it's uh, more economical to not fight the numerics of it. And uh, so, in, you know, a rule of thumb is that uh, regions that look good and have uniform symmetric appearance tend to behave better numerically. Um, uh, 
generally it's it's uh, better to use locon instead of qubit but like for example the equatorial uh refinement there um you know maybe qubit would be better because the variation in resolution uh as a function of latitude is not as great with uh, with qubit as locon um uh, convex regions you will have a lot of trouble if you try making convex region uh trying to get anything to run so um, you, you, you cannot have any kind of convexity in your uh, domains, in your refinement domains. Um, and uh, when you're uh, having a higher, you know, we're going to really high resolutions, you want to try and make those halos around that region to uh, stretch out the, uh, the transitions as much as possible. Um, there are cases, you know, maybe a case that where you wouldn't necessarily worry about that is if you're going to apply nudging around the boundary as a boundary condition where then you really, you know, it doesn't really matter because that, you know, the solution is going to be kind of fixed by the nudging. So you can get away with not doing that in that case, but in general, you want to have those halos around your region. Um, at the lower boundary, or lower of the uh, VRM editor, and then it's actually printed out with the, uh, the squad gen interface as well is the um, grid information and you look in there and it tells you kind of the minimum you know the, the the extreme angles that and uh, areas of your uh, elements and in the editor it gives you a uh, a grid you know a location lat lawn of where that element's at so you can go find those extreme elements and look at them um, and so once you're uh, you know because you're going to have these these uh, kind of skewed um, elements they're not going to be quads anymore they're going to be kind of more parallelogram looking things little diamond shapes. And so um, you want to look at the corner angles. Um, you know, if they're in the range of 45 to 135, you're generally okay. Uh, but once you go outside of that range, then you're, you know, you're, you're treading on thin ice. And um, it's kind of a fuzzy boundary, but, you know, if you get angles that are, you know, um, 38, 37, you know, you're probably going to be looking for some trouble there. And so you see, see what you can do to find that those elements and see what you can do to clean them up if you can. Um, okay, so I already said uh, try and center the uh, refinement on the face. Um, and then as Adam pointed out, you want to really avoid aggressive refinement at the edges of the cube face because you, know, um, you will have nothing but trouble if you do that. And uh, if you are having trouble with the grid, where you're having a lot of subcycling and uh, problems getting to run, um, you know, in the long run, you're better off iterating on a, a number of grids to try and you know tease out you know one that will work for you, um, and that's what uh, you know our colleague Brian is having trouble with his equatorial grid. He, he just won't run, so you know that there's a problem there, and he has to address it. Um, oh, man. There we go. Okay, um, and so, and also uh, when you start with a small refined region that you're doing a high uh, resolution in, um, you know, it, it might be better to use an any 60 uh, base grid instead of any 30. Uh, it gives you a little bit more control over um, the refinement uh, if you do that. And it's, it really doesn't cost that much to have, you know, those extra grid points in the, in the global domain. Um, uh, the polygon editor, the number of vertices can't be changed from eight. It's kind of fixed. Um, so if you have a large region, then you, can, you know, just kind of like it showed with the editor, you just kind of have to piece things together, you know, little polygon segment at a time, and then you can add up and, and make your, your region. Um, I think the, uh, the uh, previous tutorial, I did a South American grid where, you know, I had to do several, uh, you know, connect your overlapping polygons to make that region as an example uh, that was presented there. Um, sometimes if you have minor irregularities along the side of a refinement edge, you can get away with um, uh, just doing a, a very slight uh, rotation in longitude or rotate X and Y by just a very small amount. The increment, the smallest increment is 0.1 degrees. And if you just try that, the blemish goes away, then you know um, you can just move on and don't have to worry about going through an editing process. Um, the editor had a, a problem with crashing uh, frequently, um, and then when I put in these changes, I did come across um, a scenario where it was causing my failures all, all the time. Where when I was I would click on the VRM or yeah the uh, the uh, VRM tools tab. And then it would go down to create a grid. And as the mouse crossed the um, grid type, it would toggle and change it from cube sphere to icosahedral. 
and it wouldn't even notice until you hit the uh, the create grid, and then it would just crash. So um, I changed that focus problem for that, and it seemed, for at least for me, it covered a great deal of the number of problems I had with it crashing. Uh, it does crash from time to time still um, with certain combinations of um, refinements, rotations, and uh, smoothing. The uh, Actually, it's the smoothing. You know, the other problem I had was with the smoothing. So for certain combinations of settings, the smoothing algorithm gets confused, and it has more than one face associated with a given segment, and it crashes. Um, so um, that can happen. Uh, so the uh, only defense against those crashes is to save your refinement map frequently. Uh, because you can restart and then continue with where you left off. But if you did a lot of editing and spent a lot of time uh, making detailed changes and then it crashes and it's gone, it's going to, you know, it can be frustrating. You know, now you have to do all that work again. So save your refinement map as frequently as possible. Um, and yeah, it's worth saying twice if you're having trouble with the grid um, with lots of subcycling then take the time and make like a, a couple of different combinations of grids and go through and just make, you know, process them all in parallel because you're doing it once for one, it's easy to do it as easy to do it for three as it is to do for one grid. So you can just kind of go through and make a family of them and then test them all out and find out, you know, well, which one's going to work best. Um, and so now we have some examples of uh, the, some refined grids that people have done. Uh, this is uh, over uh, China with a uh, 30 kilometer resolution with a nice uh, halo around it and uh, all contained within one cube face here. And uh, this is a uh, CONUS uh, grid. And what you see here drawn is actually the script file uh, because it has like the, the very small little uh, polygons um, for each element in, the, in detail there. So it's kind of like, it looks like a script grid to me. Um, and so, uh, and you have a nice, you know, uniform halo around there. So this is a, a well um, uh, structured this, grid here. Yes, this is this is the default Conus grid that's available in CESM two point two. Yeah, so it so, is well tested. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, there we go. Um, this is a, a refinement over the Korean Peninsula. And uh, the point here is like, because those refinement maps are, you know, values between zero and one, and they're just, you know, they're being discretized. So you can have very rough looking refinement maps. The key is to get those values. So, you know, in the right position. So that causes the, um, the, uh, the cube grid to round to the right refinement value to get your, uh, you know, your uniform behavior. <clears throat> and then we have here, this is a, uh, 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 a refinement in the over the face of the Himalayas in India, and uh, on the left you can see where you know there's an irregular halo around it, and you really want to clean that up. And so going through and adding in the uh, perimeter around there, you get a nice clean looking grid on the right there, um, which I expect to give uh, pretty good results from. And so, yeah, we kind of got through the uh, so the irregularities that you know uh, occur uh, when you make that. So now we have an editor uh, that we can go through and uh, make those uh, refinements and fix them, or you can go through manually and just you know make a nice clean halo around each region um, once you have the uh, the base in there. And um, and then this is also a, a case where this is going to you know, probably have problems because you're doing a transition of resolution across the cube boundary. Um, right here is the cube edge, cube face edge, and it's going right across this region here. So that's going to be problematic. And then this is uh, another figure that shows similar uh, situation where you have this transition across this cube face. Um, these grids just, uh, they just all have problems uh, when you do them like that. And this is uh, Luis's grid, and this is kind of gets to that earlier question, when you have regions that kind of can bump into each other um, in terms of their transitions from resolutions. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen here? You know, uh, you know, is it going to be a problem or maybe it'll be okay? But, you know, uh, it's something that is when you make a grid like that and you have a, something like this, um, you spend some time looking at your answers and see if, you know, if, is there a problem here? It'd be very... Um, suspect and look for problem, you know, there's look for troubles here. And if there's none, then that's great. You know, uh, write a paper on it. We'd love to know about it. But uh, if there are, 
well, Brian Paper, we'd love to know about that too. Um, and so this is uh, using, uh, this was with the uh, locon, so it spreads out the transition over a larger region. And so in this case here, maybe Qubit will be better because it gives you, um, that, well, you don't have the transition zone, so you can probably spread those out uh, a little bit more, but then you at least um, have the re region so they're not running into each other because your transitions are over one grid element instead of two at a time. I just want to jump in and say that I have not run either of these grids and I cannot say anything about whether they work well or not. But so these are just potential well, problems I would and bet solutions. You my shiny nickel that uh, if you use this grid here, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> it's a real shiny nickel, too. It's my favorite. So, okay, so those are kind of the grids. So, uh, it, you know, in terms of the repository uh, or you know, creating the, the files, um, uh, there is a, a link to a step-by-step -step guide for the process of doing that um, and all the associated data sets. And it's at the bottom of the uh, Musica uh, page that's listed there. There's a, a, a link to a step-by-step. -step. Um, those steps are kind of generic, but they go through and they're well-tested and they've been stable for some time. And so users are encouraged when they're making their grid, just follow them, you know, just like a little recipe book and uh, go through and, and do the steps systematically. And, uh, you know, um, it, it makes life easier. Um, and if you have troubles, you can, uh, you know, you can have a reference there, but there's also um, in the docs directory or the VRM tools, I added the, uh, the demo files from last year's AMWG uh, um, uh, demonstration. And there, there's also a step-by-step -step guide for specific for a specific example, and it has the files for that grid. So if you're having trouble, you kind of decide, was it my grid or is it the processing programs? Did something change? You can use that grid and go through and follow those steps exactly. And if it fails, then there's a problem with the processing script. But if it works, then okay, then maybe there's something with your grid that you've uh, found something um, that has a problem. Uh, one example of this would be, um, I was trying to make a uh, three kilometer resolution grid over South America. And when the topography uh, software at that resolution, you know, it's kind of like that's the resolution that uh, the limiting resolution of what is was using to generate topography. And so along on the elements along the cube edge that uh, was uh, along the uh, tip of South America at the time, um, the topography software failed. And it was just that, you know, it was just, you're pushing it too far. And, uh, and that, that's a case where the programs failed. It wasn't the problem with the grid, it was a problem, you know, with the programs. And so if you use that as a guide, you, know, you can kind of, you know, uh, go through the process for something that is, should, it should be guaranteed to work at least at the time being. Uh, I'm, so and I'm, yeah, just so everyone knows, um, I'm working on improving the topography software to support three kilometer resolution. Um, and I have some results suggesting it. I fixed it. So yeah. it shouldn't be a problem in the future. Yeah. And when we find this, you know, and it wasn't, didn't you have some with um, the land, uh, the, uh, land failure with the transition uh, along the boundary? Yeah, that one that that grid that was uh, over uh, the Mediterranean where there was aggressive refinement at the cube edge, that that failed in creating the land data sets. So yeah. it wasn't even a runtime fail. It was the data set creation tools failed, and it was probably because the script grid, when you have aggressive refinement at cube boundaries, the areas probably don't add up to a unit sphere um, for some reason. So. And so if you come across things like that, because they do occur, you know, um, you do report it and then, you know, we'll go, you know, like Adam's fixed the topo thing, we'll, we'll get them fixed. But, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, it, you know, it's likely to occur from time to time. Uh, but if you go through those, uh, those step by step, you know, at least you'll be able to determine that it's not you. It's, you know, it's, you know, a problem that needs to be solved by someone else. Uh, so and then report it if you find it. Um, so most of the problems people have had uh, doing going through the process, other than those, are you know um, they're running the wrong program on the wrong machine. You know, so they're running on Casper and Cheyenne or vice versa. Um, 
And then also there's, you know, there are periodically updates. So before you do anything, make sure that you have an up-to-date uh, software from the Topo and from the VRM tools. Um, because, you know, as part of CSM development, things change. One thing that changed was the input files were reorganized uh, as a part of restructuring the infrastructure. So all the uh, all those uh, scripts that were in the VRM tools were pointing to the wrong place and none of them worked. So, but then, you know, they were repaired, but people had problems because they had earlier versions that they copied of the VRM tools and they were out of sync with, uh, with the update. So uh, update your software. Um, before you start, um, so you make sure you don't have any of those kind of problems that uh, can pop up. And uh, then, you know, certainly if you're having any problems at all uh, with any of the steps, um, you know, go, th go through the, uh, getting, make sure your, your software is up to date, um, go through the step-by-step -step guides and see if it's you or if it's your grid or your grid or if it's some in the program. And if you can't get a result, uh, there's a high resolution, variable resolution section on the bulletin board and go there and uh, submit an issue and uh, we'll get right on fixing it. So, uh, so other problems that occurred, um, you know, GLAND is renamed to, to GRIS and, you know, that's a recent development. And uh, so the problems associated with that. Um, and then one other thing that happened is some people are not using um, FHIST, I don't know why, because is there anything else in the world? So when I made the install script, it was based off of FHIST. Um, and uh, so everything is configured with that in mind. So users that have other COM sets, you know, have had to figure out what additional alternate information uh, was required for that COM set and, and sort out those details. And one of the changes, uh, you know, uh, nameless values change and they evolve and with model development. So um, the uh, in the SC uh, name list, uh, like SC Ray, uh, there's th like three parameters that have been removed from the name list. So, you know, the install script kind of uses the uh, set version that's out of sync with that. So you kind of have to just erase those and, uh, and move on with your life. Um, but and then, you know, the kind of the last thing in this section is there are changes coming. Uh, the CF CSM infrastructure has changed from MCT to NUOPSI. Um, so the good news is that um, it's going to eliminate a great deal of work spent running those gen underscore programs. All that, all those data set generation and all the mapping files, that's all going to be, um, you know, you're going to pass the mesh file and that's going to be all done internally um, at startup. Uh, so a great number of that work is, or a large part of that work is going to go away. Um, you'll still be making topography and things like, you know, some files, but you know, for the most part, uh, almost all that goes away. Um, but the bad news is for a time, uh, you're gonna have, we're gonna have, because a lot of users still use legacy tags. And so we're gonna have new tags. And so you're gonna have this kind of hybrid thing. We're gonna have to support both modeling frameworks. Um, so we're gonna try and keep that process as simple as possible for this transition time. But, you know, there probably will be a little bit of, uh, of, of effort to have to kind of maintain your repositories to support both uh, environments um, in the near future, certainly by the next release. Um, so sort of maybe the, the um, tip is to, for everyone to just keep using CESM 2.2 um, for now, that that for probably now. is simplest. Yeah, because you know, I we I haven't worked out the what you know how to make things work in the new stuff. Um, kind of you know, starting meetings uh, with the um, the folks that are making those changes. Probably you know I had one meeting so far, and then I'll continue on with that next week. So uh, you know we're trying to figure out you know how to make it se as seamless as possible for the users. But right now you know there is no set methodology for making it work on a new ops. So you have to work that out and get that sorted out. But uh, like I said, we'll try and make it as simple as possible um, in the future. Oh, wrong way. So, um, so in terms of establishing defaults, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, the um, first goal is you know we're, we're trying to get this five day run, so we we're trying to find these optimal values uh, uh, settings where you know we get the model run stable, but we don't want to go wasteful and make it you know too short of a time step and then waste a lot of cycles that are really not uh, doing any benefit uh, in terms of the output results. Um, 
the uh, parameters that you're going to be looking at have a hierarchical re relationship and uh, they affect different processes. And uh, uh, the highest level is the PE layout. You have to make sure you have sufficient memory and processor resources to fit your grid. And as you get to higher and higher grid uh, uh, numbers, you know, that becomes more of an issue uh, in terms of figuring out how many processors you're going to need to actually get it to run. And then if you get to, to really high resolution, then you can have memory that exceeds, you know, your memory per, um, per, per process gets to the point where you can't use all 36 processors on a node and you have to start reducing the processor count um, per node. Um, but, you know, uh, that's kind of not documented, but if you have that trouble, then, you know, there's ways of, of reducing that and getting your model to run uh, for the really, really high resolution uh, grids. Uh, so, and then the, you know, the main uh, 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 course toggle is going to be your time step. That's your ATM NCPL. Uh, and that sets the time step for your physics and everything is based off of that from there forward. And then there's um, the dynamics has a number of, uh, of sub-cycling uh, uh, iterations, loops uh, that are controlled by a series of uh, split values, n-split, r-split, q-split, and hypervis sub-cycle. And so the, uh, you know, um, and if you look at Adam's document, he has, does a really good job of kind of going through the process of, of kind of like figuring out how to set those values. And so um, follow that, um, it's been a good guide. And I think it's uh, a lot of people have, you know, used it successfully to get their grids running uh, so far. Um, and we're running out of time. And so, yeah, so, and then those values are set in the, um, and, you know, when you figure out your values, then you update the files that are in your repository. There's a shell commands where you set your, uh, your tasks and uh, your time step. And then there's the um, name list values that set the splits. And you set your, you know, your defaults there in your repository. And then um, once you have uh, um, the five day running, that interpolate initial visualization file that you're starting out with um, invariably has is going to be out of balance because it's not meant for the grid resolutions you're running at. So it's going to, in general, require shorter time steps for starting up. But once you have that those values run and you get your five day run going, and, and then you should follow up with that and create a new initialization file, and then um, use that as put that in as your default, and then you can further you know optimize your values based off of that. And then um, when you know once you're done, put those in your repository, and then those are your defaults from moving forward. And then um, the additional steps you have to do is you you, throw, you know if you're doing science, you have to spin up a surface. Um, you have to, uh, you know, uh, conservative emissions data have to be processed for your new grid. If you're going to nudge, you have to generate nudging data for that grid. Um, and then you have to, you know, uh, put in chemistry for your initialization file if you're running chem chem. And uh, and so you know, there's you know these additional steps for, you know that you need if you're going to do science. And with that, uh, I think that we end with a list of resources that are available for uh, people to. Uh, look up for further information. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so it's getting late, but we're happy to answer any questions if anybody has them now. I didn't hear from a lot of people that, I didn't hear from very many people at all that they were actually actively working on grids, but maybe some of you are. And, um, we didn't leave time to for really hands-on work this time, but if you want to have, if you need help with um, making your grid and it would be helpful to have um, something like the office hours that we've been advertising, um, let me know and we can set something up. Um, if uh, I know it can be, um, there's a lot of information here and it's hard to keep all the steps straight, but um, hopefully the documentation is clear. Um, but if you want some interactive help, we can certainly uh, do that, but you'll have to let us know. Um, I'm not sure that our office hours times that we've picked have been um, really helpful for everybody, but, um, or the, 
a good time for people. So um, just let us know and we'll try to set something up. So I'm glad everybody's found this helpful who's written in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, raise your hand, speak up. And this has been recorded and I'll post the recording soon so you can go back and um, watch it and get more information at, at the pace you need. And we'll try to keep the documentation updated. So if you come across any um, mistakes, let us know about that too. Okay, so this should be on YouTube uh, at some time in the near future, right? Right, yes. Excellent. I've gotten feedback that these YouTube tutorials are very helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of people like watching things. And I've also posted the slides. So, you know, the combination of, um, you know, all the work Patrick did on the um, real-time editing of the VRM editor isn't in the slides, but um, you'll be able to watch that in the video. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um.